Welcome back to BSA by Design, a podcast about transforming healthcare, educational, and research facilities through expert design and insight. I'm your host, Brian Moore. Thanks for joining us again. In this episode, I'm joined by Josh Vell and Paul Harry to talk about sustainability and what it means to our clients and end users in the healing, learning, and discovery market. We touch on sustainability, systems, carbon, geothermal, daylighting, and flexibility as sustainability. First, let me introduce our guest. Josh Bell is the Director of Design at BSA and graduated from the University of Utah with a BS in Architectural Studies and a Master's of Architecture. Prior to BSA, he worked as the Higher Education Practice Leader for Perkins & Will. He joined BSA in 2018 as a regional director and then became director of learning and student life practice leader. Since June of 2020, he has been our director of design. Paul Harry is a principal engineer with BSA. He graduated from Penn State University with a Bachelor of Architecture Engineering degree, HVAC, Energy and Integrated Design. He is LEED AP certified and prior to joining BSA in 2022, Paul previously worked for RMF Engineering Brady and Dewberry. Thanks to you both for joining me on the show, Paul and Josh. As I like to do with all of our guests, let's get a little background on you both. Josh, I'll start with you. Um, where does your passion for design come from? What made you want to get into this as a career? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it probably started a little bit when I was young. You know, I was raised by a single dad who was kind of working his way through college as a carpenter and a roofer and uh <laughs> This was the 70s, so, you know, life was a little different then, and he used to take me out on the job site, you know, he'd tie a rope around me, put me on the roof while he did his work, and so I was always kind of around build sites as a kid, and thought that was pretty cool, you know, I had my own hammer, which I was not very good at using. And then later in life, you know, I started kind of gravitating towards, you know, some things in high school that were around technical drawing, I thought that was kind of interesting, and sort of landed at that stage in my life that, that architecture might be a, a good fit for me. Figured out what college to go to, got into the program, you know, scared myself to death, thought, what have I done to myself? This is not going to be easy. <laughs> this is going to be really painful, but stuck through it. And I'm glad I did. You know, it's it's one of those things where you, you get to a place where you realize that you can have a big impact on things, if that makes any sense, you know, and, and sort of get to see the cycle of, of, you know, things coming out of the ground on a pretty consistent basis. So it's always appealed to me for that reason. And, you know, you get to be a little bit creative and kind of think about things in clever ways. And I, I like that. Paul, how about yourself? What what got you interested in engineering? Uh, I actually started out being interested in more of the artistic side and, and drawing and drafting in high school. And it kind of led to interest in design. But I also, also like the math and science and the, and the sciences. So kind of lean towards engineering more so. But I found out in high school that uh, Penn State had a leading, one of the leading programs in the country for architectural engineering, which at the time, you know, was totally new to me. I didn't, I'd never heard of it. Uh, it's a five-year professional degree. So I went into that program and uh, really enjoyed it. Um, it really combines the two. Um, so it's an engineering perspective, but all geared towards buildings, building systems. So um, enjoyed that. And then I always enjoyed working on the building aspect and the coordination aspect. In architectural engineering, you get exposed to all the disciplines. So you might focus on mechanical like I did, but you're exposed to structural and architectural and construction management and electrical and everything. So it's really interesting from a building's perspective. And then I think a little bit of my artistic side always kind of liked architecture and still liked, you know, the, the aesthetics of design. Thank you both for sharing that background. So I brought you both on to talk about sustainability. It feels like this is a topic that's everywhere in almost every industry that I can think of. And I did a little research and found out there that, that the term sustainability was coined in the late 1980s, but it's really picked up over the last 10 to 15 years, I'd say. Paul, you've been an engineer for a number of years. When did you start focusing on sustainability practices? Well, it, it, to me, it seems like it's it's always been part of good engineering design. I think it's had different names, but Early in my career, I did a lot of work with hospitals and universities that had lab buildings and had concern for the full life of a building 50 years and beyond, um, you know, very long term outlook and doing life cycle costs. So fortunately, early in my career, I got to work on some very interesting buildings and those type of things where where quality was 
uh, important. So they're willing to spend money on good systems. So I learned a lot about systems sustainability from the standpoint, what's going to last long, what's going to perform really well, what's going to have good energy efficiency, because if it makes sense economically, some of the things that have, I guess, kind of crept in or become part of the sustainability discussion are a lot of other things um, like commuting and bus routes and bikes and Daylighting, which is another really cool design that affects engineering, but but energy is a big part of it. Energy is a big part of LEED and, and these different programs trying to save energy, and, and it ripples, you know, has a ripple effect out through the building. So have always always really kind of built on that experience and getting more into energy modeling as as computers were developed over us uh, older people's careers. <laughs> we started out computers, and now it's in, in a part of everything we do. So just using the new tools and and the Revit and and different tools now for daylighting and energy monitoring are really great tools to bring the sustainability features together. Paul and I had to hang up our, our set of punch cards for the computers that we got used to using. <laughs> well, cool. I'm a drafting pencil. I used to love drawing by hand. I still sketch I still sketch like some of the architects around the studio. So I was going to ask that. Do you still like it. drawing by hand? I'm yeah. trying to keep them hidden though. So. Paul, while we're on that, can you talk about where carbon fits into to this idea of sustainability as well? You know, carbon is, is thought to be a bad thing, but uh, like many things in our environment, they're good and there are pros and cons. Carbon is now seen to be seen as a contributor to greenhouse gases and effect on the environment, which is you know highly debatable versus versus things like refrigerants and ozone depletion that were definitely bad that have been that have been phased out. So I think the discussion of sustainability has kind of grown into or, or branched out. Maybe it's one branch of this carbon neutrality or trying to reduce carbon footprint. Just because that's that is thought to be a good indicator overall environmental performance, even though it's just one factor, um, it's weighed very heavily. And I think there's a lot of different views on that. I don't think that's a given. So so it's important. I think it depends on the client's viewpoint of it. Definitely there's some political stuff and laws that are that are, you know, that may or may not be made or that are, you know, a whole other issue. But just to us it's more focused what's what's the client want, what's the client's interest. And certainly you know, doing things for the right reason for energy savings or economic benefit are going to have a side benefit of reducing carbon as well. So I don't think we do things specifically to reduce carbon so much as we do things that are good design and make sense from an energy and economic standpoint. Josh, wh- why is sustainability important to BSA as a firm? Well, I think, you know, if, if anybody knows a little bit of something about BSA, they know that we're very much mission driven. So, you know, the, the, the types of markets we choose to work in are you know, specifically those that we think have a, a big impact that can that can change lives for the better. So I don't think you could think of a better topic than sustainability as an as, as a, a pillar of that. I think most people would like a planet that's healthy and and, and livable for the next right. several thousand years for their families yeah. today and those yet to come. So it's kind of a no brainer, really. You know, as Paul mentioned, our clients are really sort of in it for the long haul. Most of the work we do is, you know, built around the conversation of, you know, this building's got to last 50, 100 years or longer. And, you know, when you're thinking about that and you're thinking about sort of the best practices in engineering, design, whatever you want to call it, the, the, the sort of future proofing that you can accomplish by being as efficient as possible so that, you know, you're not spending a lot of your capital resources on things that can be volatile, you know, the cost of energy goes up and down and, and it's not likely that it's going to get significantly cheaper tomorrow based on what's going on today as as renewables become more prevalent you know maybe that's the case you know to touch on on carbon neutrality i mean that's that's really the thing like it it really wouldn't matter how much energy we used if we had a perfectly clean source of it right you know the reason that carbon uh, becomes part of the conversation is because it's a it's a metric of of sort of the waste byproduct that has an impact on on you know the potential for global warming and so that's why we we care about it today when pv panels are are everywhere and can do all the jobs and and wind and solar wind farms can can do everything we need we could probably talk a little bit less about it but back to why it's important to us you know we feel like it really supports the mission of our clients we really feel like it's uh, it makes good economic sense it's another front where we can spend time learning how to innovate and basically, you know, it's it's a way to demonstrate that we're in it for the greater good. You know, we're not just here to be a design firm that has a business model that you know makes some money and pays some people and does that forever. We're we're really interested in how to make this place that we call Planet Earth a better place and and make life on it better for those that that live here with us. 
Yeah, I was going to add, add a couple of thoughts. I think, again, from the engineering perspective, I agree with Josh. We've always tried to look out for those long-term interests. And like I said before, but across the engineering spectrum, there's there's such a wide range of things you can do. And there are some that are obviously good from an energy or sustainability and even the interior environment, like I said, daylighting. Yeah, you save you save electricity, but daylighting is such a pleasing environment. It actually helps production and performance of the people in the building. And then things like water savings, there might be some easy things to use low fixtures, but maybe you don't go so far as to put a gray water system because it's so expensive. There's no payback unless you're just trying to get a lead point. So there's things across the whole scale that we try to help inform our clients. You know, what are those pros and cons and what's which things make a lot of sense to do whether you're getting a lead or a green globes or not, because it's going to going to be the best for your building in the long run. Uh, so there's this wide range of things on the engineering side with water savings and electricity, electric and different types of mechanical systems and ground source heat pumps. So evaluate those in terms of the saving, but don't come and insist on a solution, but give the, give the, give enough information so the client and the engineer and the architect can make those decisions together based on the best you know, kind of synergy and long term. Uh, long-term benefits. Paul, I know in 2022, the Inflation Reduction Act was passed, and that's something that you, we would believe that would benefit many of our clients in healing and learning and discovery. What are, what are some of the insights that you can share about that? Yeah, excellent, excellent point, because that just rolls right into the, kind of the next thing where we're at and kind of in, in the time scale of history is now there's a lot of these incentives. And over time, there's been different types of rebates that may be local, could be national, but this Inflation Reduction Act is really a focus on on promoting sustainability to the standpoint that there's huge rebates and whereas a lot of things in the past were tax incentives government entities couldn't take it, take advantage of our nonprofits now it's there's a there's a component that's that's done as a rebate of your construction costs so nonprofits and and other um non-taxpayers can actually benefit 30 to 40 percent of the mechanical system cost if it meets certain of the sustainability requirements and one of those big ones is the ground source heat pump, which is more of an all-electric system using the ground as your heat source or heat sink um, instead of other types of conventional equipment. So it does afford new opportunities where instead of just improving the payback or life cycle a little bit, it actually may lower the first cost of the system to be lower than a system that's not as good. So you usually pay a premium for a better system and you're trading off energy savings or some long life. Well, now you can actually possibly get a better, efficient, long-lasting system for a lower first cost than a conventional system. So the, the rebates are so significant that they're actually shifting that whole decision process. I was just going to add, you know, it, it's really significant when you think about the majority of our clients sort of live in that world of they're a government-funded entity or they're a nonprofit 501c3 or whatever it happens to be. And oftentimes, you know, they're trying to set budgets for capital investment some number of years in advance because they have to plan these things out. It's not like they've just got a fat bank account sitting somewhere. You know, the ability to apply some of those rebates to offset that first cost can be the difference between a yes or a no when it comes to filling a need for for them. You know, if, if the choice is you could build 80% of what you need in terms of the space that you that you're that you require to, to perform the, the functions, teach the students, you know, treat the patients, discover new things, or you can take advantage of this rebate and get get a better performing system, that's you know, that's a that's a win win for sure. And you know, it's it's often been the case that the conversation is is generally around, you know, what what do I need to spend to get that system? What am I looking to save? Do I have any flexibility in how I allocate my budget funds or look at, you know, ongoing operations costs, et cetera, to offset some of those things? But they're, you know, the money gets sort of painted and colored in a specific way. And it's often, you know, handed out by legislatures and other things. So it's sort of like, you know, this is what you got. So <laughs> do the best that you can with it. If you can get that better performing first system that, you know, sometimes is is every bit as easy to maintain as what they're used to, then, you know, everybody's everybody's smiling at the end of the day. Yeah. And I, I'd smile at 30 to 40 percent rebate, too. <laughs> that's yeah, a, that's like, a significant I, I number. 30 percent rebate on the cost of eggs right now. You know, that, that'd be right. Fine, <laughs> yeah. You name it. Right. Stay, staying with that theme a little bit, Paul, what, what have you noticed in, uh, about with our clients in terms of looking into geothermal energy solutions? You know, there's been a little bit of it. I wouldn't say a huge amount. A few years back, I worked on a projects that the goal was to be net zero or net positive energy. So it was one of the 
one of the resources or ways to get there. So if you have a really high goal, it's been used in the past to kind of get get that extra top level, whether it's platinum lead or you know a net zero building, because you can save significant energy on the mechanical system. But I don't I haven't seen too big a too big a surge necessarily people taking advantage of the Inflation Reduction Act. And a lot of our clients, the projects that I'm working on right now anyway are hospitals and hospitals are going to be the last to incorporate some of these things because they're Systems are very large and established, and they're usually adding on an existing system. And you know, it's health and safety are priority. Not they might have some concern about energy, energy and sustainability, but they've got to have client safety. I mean, patient, you know, health is top priority, and, and the cost of their doctors and the other operations are m- much more than somebody you know operating an office building or a classroom or something. So their their operational costs sway their decisions more than their their building and system. So I think there's a lot of interest. I've seen a lot of seminars of of I've given a few, a lot of discussion about it. I haven't seen it implemented in a whole lot of projects, but I think there's definitely much higher interest now, let's put it that way. Some of our studios, some areas of the country are not as conducive to ground source heat pump. This, this area is very good. I've had the pleasure of doing a few projects in the Intermountain West over the years. You know, and the, and the conditions at the particular, you know, and the particulars of, of their site have to be right for it to, to make sense. What I did find, though, is that, you know, there's a certain scale at which it makes sense. So some of the smaller projects really struggle to absorb some of that first cost. But in university settings, you know, when they when they have an opportunity to sort of create a district energy approach, you know, they've got several buildings and they can invest in the infrastructure and they can use that geo that ground source system for two, three, four or more buildings with kind of a, a small central energy plant. That can go a long way because you can you basically run it 24 hours a day. It's just the you know the, the price you pay to run some pumps. So pretty simple that way. Yeah, that's a great point, Josh, because a lot of the institutional clients can apply it more at the central plant level to help supplement maybe their central plant as opposed to a more commercial approach where you have water source heat pumps throughout the building and they're tied to the ground source loop. And now you have you know, that equipment throughout the building and more maintenance and things like that. So there's a kind of a commercial approach that we don't get involved in versus more the institutional uh, approach. Josh, what else have you noticed about our clients in terms of some of their sustainability needs? Well, I think, you know, there's there's been kind of a welcome addition to the conversation. Things that are, you know, a little more the humanity of it all. As Paul mentioned, daylighting is a great thing because it creates a wonderful environment. And I always sort of make the joke that, you know, literally everything on this planet is powered by the sun. Uh, and in the higher ed world work that I do, you know, students are no different. Like you can always find where the students are because they're sitting by the windows. It's just, it's one of those things that it helps us recharge. It connects us to things in the outside world. You know, we spend a lot of time indoors, but I think as, you know, creatures that grew up on a planet with water, air, and light, you know, we just sort of have an innate craving for those things. And it improves, you know, it does improve uh, productivity. It helps people be more creative. You know, there's plenty of studies out there that would tell you that some connection to nature and and access to daylight is good for patients. Um, I'm always reminded of uh, one of the first examples of that was a a hospital that famous architect by the name of Alvar Alto designed back in like 1920 something. I think it opened in the in the early 30s and it was uh, it was in Finland and it was basically a sanatorium for folks that were being treated for tuberculosis and his theory was really all kind of conjecture and sort of intuition at the time was that you know getting fresh air and being outside is good for you especially if you have something as lousy as tuberculosis so The whole project was designed around the idea that, you know, you had a room that was the place that you stayed, but you also had direct direct access to the outdoors. And they started prescribing, you know, specific amounts of time outside to enjoy the sun when it was there. You know, like Finland's kind of a cold place certain times of year, so I'm sure it wasn't every day they were out there. But I think there was a lot of thinking that, you know, has kind of come back around to that idea, you know, that providing a view to nature, providing a view to uh, something that seen as sort of flourishing helps our our psyche. And uh, in the discovery work that I've been involved in, you know, if you give one of these, you know, kind of mad scientist genius brains a a way to sort of gaze off into the future and and contemplate what they're doing, uh, it helps them focus their research in ways that they maybe would not have. You know, I I spent a little time as an undergrad working in a lab. It was like a part-time job on campus, so it was perfect. But, you know, like, 
my lab had windows, which was really awesome, but the lab next door to me did not. And you could see it on the, on the poor folks' faces every time they get out of there. It's like, you know, I've been in a dark box surrounded by beakers and chemicals for hours. You know, so I've always kind of taken that uh, that experience to heart when I think about places where people work and study and, 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 and heal. No, it, it's a good point. My wife and I were just talking about this last night. Uh, you know, as uh, I'm going to say this for our listeners, but being located in Indiana, uh, at the time of year that it is right now, I don't think we've seen the sun in about three and a half weeks and you can, you can really feel it, you know, all throughout the day. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Well, we've we've talked about the client side of sustainability. Let's shift our focus to the end users. You started to talk about that just a little bit in your last response, Josh. Um, patients uh, and the end users in our learning markets, uh, students uh, who use these spaces. What does sustainability mean culturally to these groups? Well, I think you know you, you'd be hard pressed to find students, many students these days that wouldn't place you know the health of our our environment as a as a high priority on their list. I think that, you know, there's a lot of mystery around what that means. And, you know, buzzwords kind of get thrown about quite a bit. But really what it is, is it's a way to demonstrate. And I think, you know, you see a lot of universities that are mandated, you know, we're going to design to a minimum level here because we feel like we owe it to future generations to do this. But it's a way to demonstrate and sort of prove what you're doing. You know, people talk about rating systems like LEED um, or Green Globes. There's also some that go into more of the kind of the, the wellness side. There's the well building standard. There's there's the living building challenge, which is which is sponsored by the International Living Futures Institute. And, you know, they sort of have all kind of gravitated to a to a place where it's like, you know, we have to think about our built environment as something more than just being less bad, right? You know, so if I cut half the energy out, it's less bad. But if I can design a project that is, you know, able to take care of all of its own needs and put something back, then it's regenerative. I and mean, that's pretty aspirational. It's not the easiest thing to do, but there are some examples out there. And there are some examples in climates that, you know, have not been, you know, sort of thought of as the most hospitable for that sort of thing. When those examples exist, you know, the students, uh, I think, really appreciate that, that kind of commitment. It's a long-term view. I always say that, you know, the, the students that are successful in the, the world of higher education are the ones that achieve a really strong sense of belonging. And that's sort of built around this idea of community. You can really think about being thoughtful about the built environment and how it supports your life and the life of those to come as, as sort of a, you know, the cornerstone of building community. It's, it's, it's a little, little left of center, you know, right of center, however you want to think about it. It's a way to really connect people in a long-term sense. Um, and, and it's a little bit about future-proofing, too. You know, it's like we don't know what we're going to need this building to do to tomorrow versus what we need it to do today. Um, and so I think a lot of sustainable principles lead to a place where, you know, you, you can make that, that, that space do 10 things instead of just one over time and you can do it easily and simply and with less waste and et cetera, et cetera. At the end of the day, it's thinking about things in the right way and thinking about, you know, well building standards and, and, and so forth. It's ultimately just good for the people that, that rely on your, your institution and it's, it's good for your bottom line. Anytime you can save money on something that you're not, you know, just sort of evaporating the air, that's a good thing. It's a good strategy, I think, for making sure that you remain relevant as well. So something else that comes to mind, and this could be for either one of you to answer in terms of sustainability, is that healthcare facilities focus on the long-term care of patients. So what about the focus on the long-term care of the buildings and environments that these patients are in? I'll say one thing, and then I'll let Paul jump in there. Like nobody disagrees with their doctor when they say, you know, if you keep this up, you're going to have X problem, Y problem, Z problem, and it's going to show up pretty quick here. And so you kind of go, okay, let's, you know, let's change some things. <laughs> let's make sure we get the most out of it that we can. And I think, you know, the, the principles of good design that Paul talked about, which have always kind of been there, regardless of how they've been branded as sustainable or not, are, are absolutely true. You know, if, if you do the right things and do the smart things, you've got a long-term asset that will stay relevant for many, many years and will, you know, continue to function at the top of its game for as long as it can. I think there's definitely an increased awareness. I think skepticism for good or bad because of the past couple of years of history and government and even in the health 
profession, the health providers, you know, there's been some damage done, I think, to perceptions and but people are more aware, which is good. And I think they they challenge things. So I think the whole awareness side of it can be a very positive thing when we're trying to do the right thing for the client or the right thing for the patient, the users of the buildings. We're trying to benefit both, you know, by creating better buildings. You know, it used to be engineering was pretty much in the background. If you had no calls, no complaints, that was that meant everything was good. You only hear about it when somebody's not comfortable. So I like to think of our job, uh, you know, I'm a mechanical engineer, but I'm often in charge of coordinating all the mechanical electrical plumbing systems. Um, So looking at, again, the building as as a whole integrated, you know, coordinated building, I'd like to think of it as, you know, our job is to create ideal environments that people just, they may not know why it's ideal or what the temperature humidity is, but they know they're comfortable or they enjoy being in the space. So, and then a lot of these rating systems, you know, the lead in the well building, they do provide a benefit of that communication of some of these things that in, in sometimes layman terms, you don't have to be highly technical to understand the points, you know, okay, I'm getting points for doing this better for owners and even sometimes down to the users, understanding that and maybe just seeing where some of that's coming from, what the goals are of the building and, and incorporating that stuff and putting it into terminology that every, that's consistent. Everybody's using a same rating system. Everybody's talking about the same points or, or benefits, you know, whether it's daylighting or energy efficiency or reduced water, you know, water savings. So I think that's, that's helping when you're trying to do what used to be maybe considered as extra. We're going extra. We're doing these extra things. We're doing these ex- expensive things. They really have real benefit. And that's the kind of things we want to try to communicate. We help design those into the building, not those things that are just getting a point or that are out of out of whack with the, what the cost is versus the benefit. Try to do the things that make sense. So I, I do kind of like the design environment now with kind of the, the raised awareness kind of across the board of our clients and the users and understanding a little bit about what at least the engineers are trying to do as well as the architects. I think there's been a better understanding of what, what it means to kind of look at something from a life cycle cost analysis. And I'm always encouraged when clients are asking for that, like, you know, hey, can you do a life cycle cost analysis of this system versus that system? And it, what it really does is it lays out pretty clearly, like, you know, how much benefit is there to going down this road versus the other? And some clients get pretty excited about it. Sometimes it's it's even simpler than, you know, the complexity of systems. It's just, you know, making the right choice about the stuff you put in a building. There's a whole list of, of red list materials that, you know, we're working to avoid. And, and to some degree, it takes a little time for the industry to catch up. You know, they have to, you have to have a supply of the things that you need for particular kinds of environments. But getting healthier materials in there that don't contain the kinds of things that are known to make you sick or, or could potentially cause problems has been a, a lot of fun to talk about uh, and see that incorporated in. You know, like I said, I was a kid from the 70s, so I'm pretty sure that I, you know, was probably born in an environment filled with asbestos and, you know, all the bad things. <laughs> Lead-based paint. <laughs> Lead-based paint, you know, some good stuff like that. You know, I'm pretty sure, okay. that, you know, like everybody smoked everywhere when I was a kid. So. <laughs> That's true. I play outside <laughs> all the time. I drank out of the garden hose. There was no fears about that. You know, all right. All, no, <laughs> no, no. It no. definitely makes you stronger. But, uh, <laughs> you know, as gotten into my fifties, I realized, you know, the warranty goes out at some point. It's over in your forties, and then stuff starts breaking. So, you know, <laughs> perspective on it now than I maybe did at the age of or so. I I do want to pivot back to something you said a few minutes ago, Josh. You were talking about these spaces that we're trying to find multiple uses of and it dawned on me while you were talking i I was watching this show uh lessons in chemistry last fall and it's set in the 1940s and 50s yeah and so i think you know where i'm going with this but i noticed that the labs back then looked like the same labs that i had in high school you know 25 years ago so what kind of uh, yeah i know it was um what kind of work are we doing in those areas with some of our clients to create these spaces that have multiple uses and aren't aren't just siloed for one thing well, Paul can probably talk a little bit to this from an in- infrastructure point of view, but you know, when you think about teaching spaces, the you know the the age-old method was sort of the sage on a the stage. There was somebody at the front of the room, and they were giving a lecture, and maybe writing some things on a on a chalkboard, and students were hopefully paying attention. I'm sure I did at some point, <laughs> but you know, over time, it's become much more common for us to get engaged in a more active means of learning. Now, there's a time and a place for both. So 
you kind of have to balance like how do you want to deliver information what's the right way for students to receive it what's the right way for them to come together what's the right way for them to synthesize it you know so that they can they can get the most out of that experience as possible so we've started thinking about our teaching spaces in a lot of different ways like it, it can't just be a lecture hall with thick seats and tab on arms. it's got to do other things in a lab environment sometimes it's as simple as you know hey if we put the right kind of water, gases, electricity infrastructure in, you can sort of change up a lab pretty quickly and effectively with some modular stuff so that the research can change as it needs to. And I think the the real power in that is that, you know, (laughs) unlike lessons in chemistry where, you know, you had your lab that was your lab for 20 plus years or whatever it happened, you might conduct research in one environment around a certain group of people for some amount of time. It might be months, it might be a few years, but people are coming and going that have different interests in different areas of study, focus, and and research that it brings a lot of uh, interesting ideas together that maybe wouldn't have occurred to folks um, if they were left to their own devices. So I think the more that we can allow for quick and rapid change and the more we can do it without... Uh, requiring a lot of intense remodel, the better situated folks are for for you know picking up what's coming down the pike. I mean, I think the pandemic taught us a little bit about that in learning environments too. You know, all of a sudden everybody was sitting behind a Zoom screen, and uh, it's not uncommon now to hear professors you know say, "Well, I'm going to record all my lectures, and then when we have time together in class, we're going to spend it you know working through problem solving together in teams, and we're going to we're going to how to how to how to work with other people." <laughs> Because, you know, I like to think that I'm kind of smart about some things, but, you know, like being trapped in my own brain is probably not the best thing for me or anybody else. In in terms of design for flexibility, I think we're seeing it almost as a as a given or a common need in, in like the healthcare, maybe outpatient spaces that change with clinics and change with some of the insurance laws. What's, you know, more and more things being done out of the hospital proper uh, and also labs. Labs are constantly being shifted and changing and wanting to adapt to different research. So to make those flexible, it's it's usually going to add some cost right, to, the, to mechanical electrical systems in the form of you know maybe upsizing incrementally. Like if you're going to already you already got a bunch of duct work and piping in there, if you just upsize a little bit to give it some flexibility, design for a little bit more outside air in the event you might need it. So, so there's going to be usually some additional cost, but when you compare that to doing a full renovation to change out, it's much less. So usually you've got to have those conversations with the owner and see what, what their objectives are, how, what's the likelihood in five years or in 10 years. Because if you if you incorporate that into the design and give them that flexibility, it will definitely save them a lot of money in the long run. Oh, for sure. I mean, the most sustainable material that there, that there is out there is the one you don't have to use. So if you don't have to engage and really you know, heavy renovations, then you're ahead of the game to start with. And as I think everybody's probably noticed pretty sharply in the last few years, things don't get cheaper to build over time. So I'd rather build everything I need in today's dollars than tomorrow's dollars for sure. I wanted to wrap up by asking each of you, what are some things that get you excited about this space of sustainability as we move into the future? And um, Paul, why don't you go first? It goes back to my goal of always creating ideal environments for whatever that need of the client is. And, you know, that includes temperature, humidity, lighting, daylighting, even its impact on acoustics. You know, the systems have an impact on that. And then integrating that with the aesthetics of the architecture. Much of what we do is much more integrated than it used to be in the past where the engineers would be given a plan or a building and here, put your system in there. Now we're talking about daylighting and volumes of spaces and air changes from the very beginning. So our schematic designs are now much more integrated. So that's very exciting for me. I want to be involved with those architects as early as possible, even in pre-design when we're talking about concepts and what's the orientation of the building, even with solar angles and things. So I think that it's really neat to see and it's, it's very enjoyable to design in that in that capacity where the, the team is all designing together much more than 30, 40 years when I started, when I started in this business uh, some, some number of years ago. So that's, that's a really neat thing. Um, and I think the, the awareness that I talked about, I think having more people aware, even if you're not doing the rating systems or people, you know, you don't want to get bogged down in counting points and credits, but there are some really good things that it does help communicate a why and what to do to, to have a better performing building. Yeah, I, I would second what Paul said. You know, we're we're an integrated firm, so we approach things from that point of view. We're designing buildings that include 
all the systems and you know all the all the stuff that it needs. And there's nothing more satisfying to an architect than sort of getting the design to that stage where all of the things fit in logical manner and you're not going through all the gymnastics to get air from here to there or to deal with, you know, the solar gain from windows on a particular face of the building. You know, when it all kind of fits and it's nice and neat and tidy, it's like those little, you know, erector sets you used to get when you were a kid. Everything fits and it all, you know, all comes together and there's, there's no unnecessary things there and, and, and you're not missing any parts. That's pretty cool. And it, you know, it does have a big impact on sort of what the expression of that building is, you know, I think there's something really cool about looking at a building that takes a certain approach to shading its windows. You know, it's like we want as much daylight as possible. We'd like as much visible light transmittance as possible. We have to worry about the heat gain from the sun. So can we shade those windows in a way that's both functional, but really kind of visually pleasing. And so, you know, you'll see these expressions, you know, these these treatments on the exterior of windows with, you know, horizontal sunshades or vertical port, or even some of the parametric designs that we do in skins to kind of get that optimal shading so that the views and the daylight are preserved and you don't get any of the, you know, the unwanted things. And that, that makes for a really rich palette of, of expressions. And I think it makes, I think it makes for a, a permanent structure that kind of teaches the world a little something. It says something about its place. It's connected to its, its place, both physically and culturally can represent a lot of, of different things. And I think that's, that's pretty exciting. And the, it, the best thing for me is when, you know, when you go to a building that's just open and you see, you see folks that are using it that, you know, they, they don't spend their time talking about architecture, engineering, and design all day. You know, we have lots of what I call six dollar words for things, <laughs> but but they put it really, they put it in really simple terms. It's like oh, I noticed that this thing here does that, and it was pretty cool for me to to real to me. That's like the ultimate satisfaction uh, because at that stage, you know, somebody has taken something that you've put out there, they've internalized it, and now it's part of their life too. What a fantastic discussion around sustainability! I'd like to thank Josh and Paul for joining us on this episode of BSA by Design. If you're interested in learning more about sustainability and BSA Life Structures, we encourage you to visit our website at bsalifestructures.com. There's a link in the show notes to contact us for more information. Be sure to subscribe to BSA by Design wherever you get your podcasts so you don't miss an episode. And we've got more content and stories to share through various platforms. So be sure to follow us on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and X. Join us again next time on BSA by design.